Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Hao Lu. I work in Google. Uh, today in this uh, talk, uh, I'm going to uh, 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 talk with my uh, colleague Barrett to share with uh, some of my experience um, using eBPF in, in optimizing CPU scheduling. Uh, so in this talk, uh, we will talk about a couple of applications in particular. On my side, I will talk about uh, two applications uh, to do performance profiling for CPU scheduling. Uh, one application is to, uh, to profile the scheduling latencies, and another is to using eBPF to profile the post idle time uh, in core scheduling. And Barrett will talk about using BPF to accelerate the uh, execution of critical paths in a, a ghost kernel scheduler. So the first application uh, providing the scheduling latencies. Uh, so this is a common, very common use case for BPF to performance profiling when it comes to CPU scheduling. Uh, so the common, uh, this is uh, our application is very similar to the run code slower. That is in the BCC tool set. Uh, so Runco Slower is a tool that to trace the long processor scheduling delays. Uh, our application is a uh, slightly different, but the methodology is similar. So we attach a tracing programs to the uh, important scheduling events. Uh, for example, like contact switch and the wake up, wake up new. And then in this, uh, uh, in this application, uh, we profile the queuing delays. That's a queuing delay is the time that spends on waiting in the run queue. Uh, in addition to queuing delays, we also uh, profile the on, -time, on CPU time. That's a time when the thread is using the CPU. Uh, that's a time from scheduled on CPU to a time that's scheduled off the CPU. And also profile the off time, of CPU, off CPU time. That was a time when thread was uh, spent in a sleep uh, state. Um, so uh, this, this, this application is a little similar to run queue slower, but I want to actually highlight two differences that we found that can be very useful in practical uses. The first is that our applications is um, uh, C group oriented profiling. Uh, but still what we're providing is that the, we don't provide, we provide the false threats, but we also aggregate the profiled results by the C groups, the CPU control C groups. Uh, by doing so, because uh, in the data center, we care uh, on node management, we don't uh, want to care, care more about is the jobs uh, service level, the jobs performance, the job was uh, modeled as the C groups. And uh, we also uh, break up the queuing delays into two parts uh, to give us more insights on the performances. The first part is the wait time. That's when the thread is waiting behind a thread that's from the same C group. And the other is the wait time behind a thread from another C group. Uh, this would help us to identify the types of starvations if it's waiting behind from a thread from the same C group, we know that this is the self starvation and the uh, users, the job user could adjust this, um, the allocation of the CPU shares within their job. If it's a uh, waiting time from, uh, it's the waiting from a thread from another C group, we know that the, the users may not have a efficient, a sufficient uh, CPU shares in their job. So in that way, we can advise the users to increase their CPU shares. Um, another difference is that we don't actually report a single value uh, for the tracing. We profile the stats and report it as uh, distributions uh, in a format of uh, histograms. Uh, within this uh, hi with these histograms, we also allow the users uh, for configuration. For example, uh, they can adjust the bucket ranges uh, for the histogram. They can also reset the values uh, to say um, uh, to do a periodical profiling there. Uh, so this application, uh, the profile results have been used as a service level indicator. Uh, for node management tools. Um, 
in Kubernetes like uh, Kubelet, uh, we have some own internal version Boglet uh, in our in Google. So these are the two differences that I want to highlight uh, in this application. Uh, so we also think I'll find that using BPF to such a profiling provides a uh, uh, benefits and uh, first it's very flexible uh, it's because it's managed by the user space the user could uh, actually uh, make changes very easily and quickly uh, without involve any uh, kernel changes um, and it also minimizes the uh, internal kernel patches we carry in Google so it's um, it's a very nice solution using BPF to this profiling so the takeaway, so just the two differences. Uh, one is to the C group oriented profiling tools and uh, the uh, report uh, distributions instead of a single value for more insights. Uh, so far, that's the first part of this, uh, or uh, the applications. Is there any, any questions there? No, I will just move on. Next. Uh, the second application is that we use, uh, we're trying to use the eBPF to do force, to account the forced idle time. Uh, first, we, I need to introduce some background here. Uh, so we have this uh, CPU scheduling feature called the core scheduling. It's a mechanism in the scheduler that mitigates the cross hyper thread attacks. A cross hyper thread attack involves a attacker and a victim running on the two hyper siblings of a call, and the attackers could steal confidential information from the victim on on the other thread on another hyper siblings. An example of the such attack is uh, our, our L1TF and the MDS. Uh, so the call scheduling the mitigation it ensures that the threads uh, could be uh, could be set could be grouped by the user space. Uh, so the uh, threads from the same group could uh, share the call. I will have an example in the next slide to show this. And uh, we expect uh, call scheduling to have a better performance compared to the option of disabling the hyper threading, SMT. So how does the call scheduling work? So call uh, before and without call scheduling, we have uh, uh, two threads that's running on two hyper siblings. They can run on without interruptions not interruption, uh, we can run. Um, but if we have a call scheduling enabled because uh, the, we, can't, we can't actually run them uh, simultaneously. So we have the call scheduling will uh, interleave their executions. So this causes a performance issue here because even untrusted thread is running on a hyper thread, the siblings a CPU could either run a task from the same untrusted group or be forced into an idle state. The idle state is a waste of uh, resources here. Uh, so that's the, a forced idle time we want to measure. Uh, so why this is important? Uh, because the users, our user in Google in using call scheduling, they want to know that uh, by enabling call scheduling, how much resources uh, efficiency they have, they have lost due to because of a forced idle. And we also want uh, uh, correct accounting for this waste of resources to the creators of the thread. For example, before the reported CPU usage for the job is the real CPU usage. But because of a forced idle time, we also want to account the a false out time to the creator of the thread. So the reported CPU usage will be the real CPU usage plus the false idle time. Uh, so it's also having a false out time also is a good indicator for core scheduling the efficiencies and also help us to understand the mechanism more to give us more opportunity for future optimizations there. Uh, but there is currently no upstream solutions on how we measure the full start time. There are several things that we need to consider if we are designing a complete upstreamable solution. For example, what if uh, we have uh, more than two hyper siblings? Uh, 
so um, in order to quickly uh, do some profiling uh, on the four cell time, we use the eBPF to fulfill such a task. And we find it's a very fast and flexible way uh, to measure four cell time. And uh, it's also could be a using eBPF to provide the signals to the user space uh, for future tooling of the scheduling the behavior uh, that our a customer, our users in Google really wants because they have some mechanism in user space by migrating threads to mitigate their if he, uh, loss of efficiency there. So similar to the previous applications, uh, the solution of uh, B using BPF to account for cell time is similar. We have a tracing program that's attached to the uh, scatter contact switch trace points and the wake up uh, trace points. Uh, so uh, because uh, these, are trace, these attached points are within a core scheduling critical sections, uh, they are protected by the synchrony uh, synchronization mechanism for core scheduling. So we really don't have like much concern about the race uh, happening between hyper siblings in the BPF programs. Uh, but this has an interesting problem uh, when, do, when I developed this uh, application is that because a force battle sibling involves we knowing the states of a two hyper threads in a core. Uh, so this requires us to know what the sibling, um, uh, the sibling have, uh, run queue is running. Uh, so the question is that from within a uh, BPF program, how do we know the sibling hyper threads uh, uh, current task? So this brings us to an interesting solution we have uh, uh, figured out. Uh, so in a BPF program, we can use uh, some, some mechanism called K symbols. Uh, so one could declare a symbol in the BPF program. Uh, if the kernel has exported a global symbol of the same name, uh, one could read the exported uh, kernel symbol via the K symbols. We have an example in the next slides. Um, so this is a way to access the kernel global variables from within a BPL program. So how do we achieve that? Uh, in the user space, the uh, libbpf could read the symbol's kernel address from KOSMs and fill in that information when we are trying to get the address of that symbols in the BPF uh, program. And the kernel BTF could be used to, uh, to detect the structure of the symbol. And inside the kernel, the verifiers will do verification to make sure that access to these kernel symbols is, uh, is safe. Uh, some concrete example here. So we now need to access the run queue of our sibling CPUs. Uh, so we can declare the run queues as the K symbols because in the kernel scheduler, we have the same variable. Of the, we have the variable of the same name. It's a static global per CPU variable. So in our BPF programs, uh, we can call a special helper for the BPF per CPU pointer. It's the same, have the same semantic as in the kernel to get the sibling CPU's uh, run queue. And from the run queue, we can detect, we can, uh, we can do reference it's a uh, current task it's running and the idle task it's a uh, queue two when compared to see if the sibling CPU is idle or not. So the complete algorithm to come to account for the four style time is uh, a following at the contact uh, switch time uh, we take timestamps uh, to indicate that we are entering a forced idle state. Uh, there are two conditions. Uh, if the sibling CPU is a uh, if the sibling CPU is idle and we ourselves are trying to execute a switching to a untr untrusted task, or we are idle but the sibling is running an untrusted task. Uh, so and the, also take timestamp we are exiting uh, this uh, forced idle state. It's the opposite of the uh, state switching. And then we charge the four style time based on timestamps. With case one, charge the time to the sibling's current uh, task. 
if it's a, a case two, then we charge it to the time to a current task, or that's a task running our local CPU. Uh, so some takeaways here is that uh, using eBPF to implement uh, CPU uh, scheduled stats is a very promising idea. It has several benefits. It's um, also uh, the ability to be able to read per static per CPU variables within BPF seems to be very powerful. It could allow us to pick more kernel states uh, from within the BPF applications. Um, there are many other static per CPU variables used by SCAD, for example, SCAD domains or some others. Uh, this could greatly improve the uh, expanded observability of the BPL programs. So this wraps up my two applications for performance profiling. Next, I'm going to pass on to my colleague Barrett for applications. Ghost. Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Al, if you get a chance, can you pass the uh, slide control to me or something? If not, I can just say next slide. <laughs> Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Barrett. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ghost and BPF. Uh, next slide, please. No, oh, thanks. I see it. Barrett, I gave you presenter status. Got it. Thanks. Okay, so what is Ghost? Ghost is a kernel scheduler class that we've been working on at Google. It uh, sits below CFS and priority. The general idea is that uh, scheduling decisions are made in user space by what we call an agent process. The uh, kernel is going to send messages to the agent, such as task X blocked on CPU 6. And in response, the agent will issue what we call transactions to the kernel, such as run task X on CPU 12. Uh, we have a simplified little drawing down here of, of the rough idea. But, you know, so we have inside the kernel, there is a scheduling class, just like CFS or, or any of the others. And uh, in user space, we've got the uh, the process sitting there running running decisions and we also have the ability for the workload itself and the agent to communicate typically through shared memory or rpcs and the workload can pass along any scheduling hints now why are we doing this good question the first off we have a lot of different workloads uh, so we'd like to have workload specific scheduling policy for instance, you can imagine having a different policy for hosting virtual machines versus running a search engine. The other thing that's interesting for us is that that agent to application interface is independent of the kernel ABI. So we can kind of experiment and do whatever we want uh, between the application and the agent. On a related note, we can update our scheduling policy independently from our kernel rollout. Rolling out the kernel it takes a little while. It's a lot of difficulties with that. Uh, if we want to quickly change a scheduling policy, especially on an application specific basis, uh, by having this agent be separate from the kernel, we can we can do that. Uh, there's a lot of details about like, why and how and all that other stuff. Uh, and I'll refer you to uh, the recent talk from uh, NetDev. And mostly I want to focus on the BPF stuff. But first I want to dig, dig in a little bit into messages and transactions. Uh, these are both through a shared memory interface. Roughly, it's shared memory plus a poke of some sort. Uh, so from the, the messages from the kernel uh, to the agents, we basically just drop a message and a ring buffer. And that's kind of what you would expect. The poke aspect to it is that we can also wake an agent on a particular CPU. So, and it doesn't have to be where the event occurred. So we can have, you know, attack X blocked on CPU six while the wake up event for the agent could could hit on CPU one, for instance. Similarly, the transactions uh, come from the agent to the kernel. Uh, it's not a ring buffer, but there's a per CPU array of uh, what we call go uh, ghost transaction structs. And it's got what you would think, like the PID for what you want to run, which CPU, and then there's a whole lot of extra little variables that we don't really need to get into, but you, things you can imagine that you would need to do to keep things synchronized. Uh, and the poke for the for the transaction is a syscall. So the agent can kick the kernel and say, hey, please look at specific transaction requests for particular CPUs. The guts of the transaction really is setting a variable per run queue in the kernel that says, hey, next time we run pick next task ghost, run this particular task. And we call that the latched task. So general idea of messages from kernel to agent, transactions from the agent to the kernel. 
And uh, there's also various ways we can design our schedulers for multi-core machines. Uh, the most basic would be the per CPU scheduler, which is sort of what people are used to these days, where there's an agent task running on each CPU that schedules its CPU only. The one I'm going to talk about more today is the global scheduling model, where we have an agent task that runs on a single CPU yet schedules all CPUs. You could also imagine various forms of hybrid scheduling, such as a per CPU model sometimes, and you switch to a global model for other things. From the kernel's perspective, there's just an agent task on every CPU, and the user space determines which tasks do what. So whether it's a per CPU model or a global model, the kernel doesn't care. That's actually a policy issue about the agent. Now, of course, you can imagine many issues with the global scheduler. I refer to these as our global scheduling woes. The big issue is that when you picture the global agent loop well, sitting there spinning on a CPU, the typical loop is going to be you handle all your messages, like all the tasks that blocked and preempted and woke up. Then given that information, you say, okay, let's schedule the runnable tasks on all my available CPUs. And then you could do all the fancy policy stuff. Like, like oh, I know certain tasks are low priority for this application. Let's do some preemptions or let's try to co-locate tasks that are communicating together adjacent to each other. Um, now, when you picture a larger machine, that loop can take a while. And of course, it's workload dependent. Like how many wake-ups per second are you handling? If you have a task, uh, or set of tasks that hardly ever wake up, you actually aren't doing a lot in your messaging loop. But if you have a very busy uh, application from a scheduling perspective, then you may have more work to do in your global loops. Similarly, if you have a complicated policy, it might take a while to compute, uh, and then that just adds to your, uh, what I call the global loop latency. So for one of our applications, on average, the global, the global loop was taking about 30 to 60 microseconds to complete that handle messages, schedule tasks, loop. What this means is that 30 to 60 microseconds is the average amount of time until the agent responds to a message. It's also the average amount of time that a CPU sits idle before the agent schedules it. Now, when you think about that last point, that, that means every time a task blocks, we're well, wasting 30 microseconds, like that's, that's way too slow. So here's a, a tool we wrote. It's a, basically like a BPF-like tool uh, that tells us from the moment a CPU goes idle until a task is latched, meaning that we've had a transaction that says run this task, how long did that take? And you can see here that the bulk of the distribution is in that 30 to 60 plus range. And uh, this is an, uh, an older one, um, but that's that right here, this big bump in the, in the distribution, that's the global agent's loop time. And that's how much time we're wasting every time we block, which is pretty bad. So let's use BPF so that we can respond quickly to these events. So we have a bunch of options. When we do pick next task uh, ghost, we have no latch task. Well, our options are, well, we can idle and then just wait for the global agent to notice. Well, that's, that's the 30 to 60 microsecond wait. No thanks. Uh, another option is we can wake that CPU's agent because remember every CPU has an agent task and we can wake that agent and that can issue a transaction. Well, well that's extra context switches. Uh, how about we run a BPF program? That also can issue a transaction. So we have a type, I refer to it as BPF PNT for a pick next task. It's a special uh, prog type that, that we've made. And it attaches at one point in pick next task goes. And what it can do is latch tasks. Or it can also wake agents. So we have a couple helpers to do this. There's the ghost wake agent helper, which is essentially the kick, kick the agent on a particular CPU. And we have the ghost run task, where we, we uh, this is basically what a transaction is, where we say, on this CPU, I want you to run a particular task. This lets the BPF do mostly whatever the agent can do. Uh, I want to emphasize that these BPF programs are part of the agent. They're extremely coupled to the agent. So they're embedded in the binary, like the BPF with the BPF skeleton. Uh, these programs have the same lifetime as the agent. Uh, specifically, the agent holds the FD open from BPF link create. They're also coded side by side, for instance. So when our EDF schedulers, C code, and the BPF code basically have them open in the same window, it's like you're programming in shared memory. And they are specifically sharing memory with the agents. Uh, I use a BPF uh, array map and user space M maps it. So I, so I tend to think of these BPF programs as just a thread that happens to be running in the kernel. Uh, and then half jokingly, I call this ring B 
analogous to Ring 3, where we have the array maps are really windows into the agent's address space. And if you want to keep pushing on the analogy, those BPF helpers, like they wake the agent and run the, run the ghost thread, uh, those are kind of the entry points to the, the kernel, like syscalls. And if we really want to go even farther, we can say that BPF prog run is sort of like the, uh, the interrupt descriptor table vectors. But the main point is that these aren't independent programs. The, these BPF, this BPF program is the agent. It just happens to be in BPF instead of in ring three. Barrett, I believe Vladimir has a question. He raised his hand. Sure. Vladimir. Go ahead, please. Yeah, go ahead if you have a question, please. Okay, I'll take that as a not available or something like it or a miss button press. We can do Q and A later. Sounds great. Please continue. Thanks. Um, so let me talk about. Uh, I have an example BPF scheduler that we that we made that runs with a global agent, where the agent in ring three is pushing runnable tasks into yet another uh, ring buffer. And the BPF PNT program consumes these tasks. So when pick next task goes comes, it will look and try to grab a task from a ring buffer. And I want to emphasize that this isn't any ABI with a kernel. This is purely between ring three and ring B, if you will. The, uh, we actually have a hierarchy of ring buffers, and you can do this based on the cache hierarchy. So you have like per CPU rings and then per NUMA rings. You can actually do whatever you would like, but this is just one, one version of this that I have for one of our global agents. And once the global agent pushes those tasks into the rings, it can actually monitor them to see, did, they, did any of the CPUs pick this task up? Uh, what, can I, what can I do? Well, then the agent can say, let's move a task from a CPU ring to a NUMA ring, or maybe just load balance in between CPUs. The, the idea here is that BPF PNT is sort of the mechanism that is gobbling tasks up from these rings and running them as it can. And then the global agent is more detached handling the bigger picture stuff like load balancing. Or for instance, if we can have a higher priority task that, that didn't run in a certain amount of time. Well, in that case, the global agent can still issue transactions to preempt some other task to, to uh, basically handle more uh, one-off events instead of just like the common fast path that we have the BPF PNT handling. And the agent can, you can come up with whatever program you want. It's all independent of the kernel. Uh, it, it's in the same idea that why we have user space ghost in the first place of like the policies in user space, you can do this independently of the kernel. Well, now you just have these BPF hooks too that you can do. Just as, a, as an example, you could, you know, we don't have this, but if there's a map type for a priority queue, you could do something like that and have per CPU run queues. It's completely independent of the kernel hooks that we've got. Uh, once I've added the global scheduling with BPF PNT, you can see the idle to latch uh, times. The bulk of the time is now when BPF pick next task finds a task to run that the agent has pushed in. However, we still have a little bump here around the, you know, the 16 to 120 microsecond mark. Uh, that's still the global agent loop. It's possible that the agent falls behind handling messages and doesn't have enough runnable tasks to keep the BPF PNT uh, threads busy. Uh, well, what can we do about that? Let's maybe talk about wakeups. So right now we have, we have BPF at pick next task, but it's not enough to only run there. We want to be able to respond quickly to thread wakeups and other runnability edges, such as yields or more specifically, uh, CFS runs at a higher priority than Ghost. So when CFS will preempt us and then return this, the CPU to Ghost, uh, that's another event when a thread becomes runnable. Well, either way, it's a runnability edge, if you will. And what we want to do is keep BPF PNT busy with tasks to run. Now, if we go back a few slides, if you recall messages, those are the primary mechanism from the kernel to inform the agent of any sort of ghost event. We got things like, you know, thread woke up, thread blocked, thread was preempted, you know, let's see, thread new, affinity change, departed, stuff like that. There's a lot of them. Now, BPF is part of the agent. Let's interpose on the message delivery itself. So I have a BPF message type uh, BPF program, and the context itself is a struct BPF ghost message. We attach it at a specific point in the 
ghost kernel code, which is the one spot where we send all messages to to uh, because of a task. And uh, basically, that gives BPF the opportunity to respond to messages even faster uh, than the, the agent's ring three code would. It's still the agent; it's just running in BPF instead of in ring three. Now, one question you may have is. Yeah, earlier, I mentioned that messaging was yet another ring buffer. Uh, could we replace ghost messaging with the ring buff? Uh, I certainly think we could. They're both shared memory ring buffers, power of two, all that stuff. Uh, one minor thing for us, at least, is that all agents would need to use BPF, which so far we only have a couple of them that are using it. Uh, the thing I, I do like about it is that it would allow agent specific customizations to those message payloads. Because right now, the like the format of the ghost thread runnable message, for instance, is part of our ghost ABI. The, that, that would be the ABI to talk to BPF, but you could imagine an agent saying, you know what, throw in a couple extra bytes of data into a payload and send it to ring three. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of where we're going with, with the wake up stuff. When you think about it, do we actually even need a user space agent? If BPF is part of the agent, you know, maybe we don't, maybe we don't need one. And uh, from my perspective, it's actually all the same agent program. And the kernel, the ghost kernel code is talking to the agent through messages. It doesn't matter if it's ring three or ring B in my, in my head. Um, either way, I sort of have a set of things I want to be able to do to enforce policy, like run task X on CPU three, or maybe just set need reskid on a CPU, kick somebody off a CPU or uh, what we don't do yet, but we were thinking about doing would be to say, hey, let, let me control what level of, of C state sleeping you want to go into. Um, so whether we have a, a user space program or a, a BPF program that does it, it doesn't, don't really care as much. Uh, and either way you do it, I think the ghost kernel code already solves many of these problems that you, that you would have, whether it's BPF or uh, purely BPF or purely user space. Uh, I guess this is a good question about what is the traditional design principle keep policy out of the kernel really mean when we have BPF involved? Yeah, it's a good question. The, you know, I, I view the BPF hooks, at least the ones that we've got as a, as the mechanism uh, where, but the policy itself is, is the, the brain that was loaded from user space, whether that was um, ring three or ring B. But, uh, uh, one of the one of the cool things we, we we've mostly sorted out is the problems of delegating scheduling to an untrusted agent, and like what are the messages, like the specific messages, and what are their semantics and some of the parameters. Uh, just as an example, I counted the number of places from which we send message tasks new. We have five of them currently, and a lot of them are just weird corner cases of, you know, uh, someone calls set sked on a task. Uh, you know, what do you do with fork? There's a lot of a lot of little messy corners. Um, one other aspect to this is that it is easier to code in user space than in BPF. Uh, for instance, we do like to communicate with our applications. So you know, we have easy access to RPCs. Uh, you can spin uh, forever in the global agent if you want. Um, there's a lot of little stuff. Uh, you don't have to battle the verifier. That's, that's a fun one. But, um, but yeah, I, I think even if I had an agent that was primarily BPF, I'd probably want a user space component just to make, make life a little easier. Uh, Anyway, the, this is just a little bit about Ghost and BPF. Uh, the main ideas behind Ghost is that we delegate kernel scheduling to some form of agent process, and that, that process is made of both user space and BPF components. And BPF is mostly used by us as an accelerator to recover some of these overheads of going out and back to user space. Because you know, Ghost basically is going to user space isn't free, and there are trade-offs with the design, and BPF sort of helps us recover some of those trade-offs. Uh, there's a lot more about this stuff, and I glossed over pretty much everything that's not related to BPF. So if you want to check out some links, there's a, our NetDev talk. Uh, there's a paper coming out in SOSP in, uh, I think, about a month or so. We also have a few links to our code in user space. That's, uh, it, it is a little behind. It does have BPF picnic stats, if you're curious, but it doesn't have that message stuff, which, I, to be honest, I did that last week. So uh, anyway, uh, I can take any questions. All right, Barry, thanks a lot. So if we have any questions, please give them now.
I guess this is an interesting general problem of putting a important kernel policy decision into a user space agent of some point. I mean, the traditional example would be like a routing daemon where we define the API for changing routes and then the user space process deals with all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Or OVS user space would maybe be another example. And here we're putting the guts of the process scheduler into a user space process as well. But using BPF as the mechanism for defining an interface to do this safely, which I think is an important component of all this work. Yeah, uh, I didn't talk too much about it, but we have a bunch of safety things uh, all in the kernel itself. So like you can only latch tasks uh, under certain circumstances. Like uh, if a task, mm -hmm. for instance, is already running on a CPU and you try to latch it somewhere else, the, you know, you'll get, you'll get an error response that says, hey, this one's busy and stuff like that. The other thing is that if, uh, if the agent, whether BPF or user space, fails to schedule a task for a certain amount of time, we've got uh, little kernel watchdogs that'll say, and this is configurable by user space when this kicks in, but if, if we, for instance, it's very easy to have an agent deadlock itself just because you know, you're, you're developing these things. Uh, the kernel will notice that and destroy the, basically destroy the agent and kick all of our tasks back to CFS. So that uh, the, the general point being that uh, ghosts shouldn't be able to permanently harm the system in any way. You might I see. That's there. good. I was curious how you would handle the case where no response happened to requests to deal with the task. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that, and from our perspective, you know, you want to run this, you get better performance out of it. But if things are turning out poorly for whatever reason, uh, mm -hmm. like our um, uh, Borg, whatever the, the, the demon that watches all of our nodes, it can come along and kill the agent if it wants. Uh, there's lots of reasons. It's, it's very easy to kill an agent, if you will, so that uh, we can restore the system to, you know, same. So if the agent dies, everything goes to CFS. Yeah. And we also have ways in which uh, we can live update, if you will, the from handoff from one agent to another relatively quickly. Like uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a larger topic, but the, the general general idea is that most of the kernel state, most of the important state is in the kernel. Like, uh, so if the agent dies and a new agent comes back up, it, it is possible to reattach to the to the previous ghost sked class. Um, the uh, like the state of all threads is in the kernel, and user space can ask for it at any time. So a new agent could come along and say, uh, "Which tasks were were there in Ghost? Let me quickly." And if you can establish it quickly enough, then the kernel won't kill and kick you kick you back to CFS right away. So there's this little timeout window. I see. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stuff like that that uh, we talk a little bit more about in some of our other our other stuff. But uh, happy to answer questions about that too. That's uh, cool. But Anyone have any questions? Here's your opportunity to ask about this. Oh, hello. Uh, excellent talk. Um, I was wondering, like, what are your plans to upstream the kernel changes? Um, so we, we have them uh, uh, upstream for the most part now, but the, the GitHub stuff lags behind a little bit. So uh, we do most of our development on our internal Google kernel, uh, mostly because the stuff we're testing it on re requires that, but we do backport the things to, uh, or forward port, I guess, but we, we, you know, we, we port them to the users, to the, to the repos there relatively frequently, um, but it doesn't, doesn't have the, the absolute latest stuff, so I have that disclaimer there. Uh, as far as getting it into the upstream kernel itself versus just being open source, uh, that's a, uh, that's a good question. I think we certainly would like that, but whether upstream would like that, that's a different discussion. I think there's a few things we want to sort out too about like, like our interface changes frequently. Um, we're on version, I think like 46 of our user API. So we, we would want to have solidified that before proposing it for upstream. Okay, Barry, thank you very much. Cool, thanks.